Adversus Judeos by St. John Chrysostom Against the Jews, Homily 2 Against those who fast the fast of the Jews, and against the Jews themselves, delivered after the other homily has been given, and five days before the Jewish fast. The wicked and unclean fast of the Jews is now at our doors. Though it is a fast, do not wonder that I have called it unclean. What is done contrary to God's purpose, be it sacrifice or fast, is the most abominable of all things. Their wicked fast will begin after five days. Ten days ago, or more than ten, I anticipated this and gave an exhortation with the hope it would make your brothers safe. Let no one find fault and say my discourse was untimely because I gave it so many days beforehand. When a fever threatens, or any other disease, physicians anticipate this and with many remedies make safe and secure the body of the man who will be seized by the fever. They hurry to snatch his body from the dangers which threaten it before the patient experiences their onset. Since I, too, see that a very serious disease is going to come upon you, long beforehand I gave you solemn warning so that you might apply corrective measures before the evil attacked. This was my reason for not waiting until just before the days of fasting to exhort you. I did not want the lack of time to stop you from hunting out your brothers. I hoped that with the span of many days you might be able to track down with all fearlessness those who are suffering from this disease and restore them to health. Men who are going to celebrate a wedding or prepare a sumptuous feast do the same thing. They do not wait for the day itself. Long beforehand they speak with the fishermen and bird hunters, so that the brevity of time may present no obstacle to preparing for the banquet. Since I too am going to set a banquet before you against the obstinacy of the Jews, I have gotten a head start in talking to you, the fishermen, that you may sweep up your weaker brothers in your nets and bring them to hear what I have to say. Those of you who did fish and have your catch securely in your nets, remain steadfast and bind them tight with your words of exhortation. Those of you who have not yet taken this goodly catch have time enough in these five days to trap and overcome your prey. So, let us spread out the nets of instruction like a pack of hunting dogs. Let us circle about and surround our quarry. Let us drive them together from every side and bring them into subjection to the laws of the church. If you think it is a good idea, let us send to pursue them the best of huntsmen, the blessed Paul, who once shouted aloud and said, Behold, I, Paul, tell you that if you be circumcised, Christ will be of no advantage to you. When wild beasts and savage animals are hiding in a thicket and hear the shout of the hunter, they leap up in fear. The loud clamor drives them from their hiding, and even against their will, the hunter's cry forces them out, and many a time they fall right into the nets. So, too, your brothers are hiding in what I might call the thicket of Judaism. If they hear the shout of Paul, I am sure that they will easily fall into the nets of salvation and will put aside all the error of the Jews. For it is not Paul who spoke, but Christ, who moved Paul's soul. So when you hear him, shout and say, Behold, I, Paul, tell you, consider that only the shout is Paul's, the thought and the teachings are Christ's, who is speaking to Paul from within his heart. But, someone might say, is there so much harm in circumcision that it makes Christ's whole plan of redemption useless? Yes, the harm of circumcision is as great as that, not because of its own, but because of your obstinacy. There was a time when the law was useful and necessary, but now it has ceased and is fruitless. If you take it on yourself to be circumcised now, when the time is no longer right, it makes the gift of God useless. It is because you are not willing to come to him that Christ will be of no advantage to you. Suppose someone should be caught in the act of adultery and the foulest crimes and then be thrown into prison. Suppose, next, that judgment was going to be passed against him and that he would be condemned. Suppose now that just at that moment a letter should come from the emperor 
setting free from any accounting or examination all those detained in prison. If the prisoner should refuse to take advantage of the pardon, remain obstinate and choose to be brought to trial, to give an account, and to undergo punishment, he will not be able thereafter to avail himself of the emperor's favor. For when he made himself accountable to the court, examination, and sentence, he chose, of his own accord, to deprive himself of the imperial gift. This is what happened in the case of the Jews. Look how it is. All human nature was taken in the foulest evils. All have sinned, says Paul. They were locked, as it were, in a prison by the curse of their transgression of the law. The sentence of the judge was going to be passed against them. A letter from the king came down from heaven. Rather, the king himself came down. Without examination, without exacting an account, he set all men free from the claims of their sin. All then who run to Christ are saved by his grace and profit from his gift. But those who wish to find justification from the law will also fall from grace. They will not be able to enjoy the king's loving kindness because they are striving to gain salvation by their own efforts. They will draw down on themselves the curse of the law because from the works of the law no flesh will find justification. So it is that Paul says, If you be circumcised, Christ will be of no advantage to you. For the man who strives to gain salvation from the works of the laws has nothing in common with grace. This is what Paul hinted at when he said, If out of grace, then not in virtue of works. Otherwise grace is no longer grace. But if out of works, no longer is it grace. Otherwise work is no longer work. And again, if justice be by the law, then Christ died in vain. And again, you who are justified in the law are fallen from grace. You have died to the law. You have become a corpse. Hereafter, you are no longer under its yoke. You are no longer subject to its necessity. Why, then, do you strive to make trouble for yourself when it is all to no purpose and in vain? When Paul said, Behold, I, Paul, tell you, why did he add his name? Why did he not simply say, Behold, I tell you? He wanted to remind them of the zeal which he had shown with regard to Judaism. What he is saying is this, If I were a Gentile and knew nothing of Jewish matters, perhaps someone would say that, because I had no share in the Jewish plan and dispensation, because I did not know the power of circumcision, I reject it from the dogmas of the church. This is why he added his name. He wished to remind them of what he had done in behalf of the law. It was almost as if he were to say, I do this not through hatred of circumcision, but in full knowledge of the truth. I, Paul, say this, that Paul, who was circumcised on the eighth day, who am an Israelite by birth, a Hebrew of Hebrews, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee according to the law, who zealously persecuted the church, who entered houses, dragged out men and women, and handed them over to the custody. All of this could persuade even those who are very stupid that I set down this law, not through any hatred, nor in ignorance of things Jewish, but in full knowledge of the surpassing truth of Christ." And I testify again to every man who has himself circumcised that he is now bound to observe the law. Why did he not say, I exhort, or I command, or I say? Why did he say, I testify? So that he might, by this word, remind us of the future judgment, where there are witnesses who testify, there are judgments and sentences. He is frightening his hearer then by reminding him of the royal throne and by showing him those very words which will be his witness on that day when each man will give an account of what he has done, what he has said, and what he has heard. The Galatians heard those words in days gone by. Let those who are sick with the Galatians' disease hear them again today. If they are not present, let them hear through you the words that Paul exclaimed and said, I testify to every man who has himself circumcised that he is bound to observe the whole law. 
Do not tell me that circumcision is just a single command. It is that very command which imposes on you the entire yoke of the law. When you subject yourself to the rule of the law in one part, you must also obey its commands in all other things. If you do not fulfill it, you must be punished and draw its curse upon yourself. When a sparrow has fallen into the hunter's net, even if only its foot is caught, all the rest of its body is caught as well. So too, the man who fulfills a single commandment of the law, be it circumcision or fasting, through that one commandment has given the law full power over himself, as long as he is willing, and if he is willing to obey a part of the law, he cannot avoid obeying the whole law. We do not say this in accusation of the law. Heaven forbid! We say it because we wish to show forth the surpassing riches of the grace of Christ. For the law is not contrary to Christ. How could it be, when he is the one who gave the law, when the law leads us to him? But we are forced to say all these things because of the untimely contentiousness of those who do not use the law as they should. The ones who outrage the law are those who bid us stand apart from it once and for all and come to Christ and then tell us to hold fast to it again. The law has profited our nature very much. I agree to that and would never deny it. But you Judaizers cling to it beyond the proper time and will not let us see how very useful it has been. It would be the greatest source of praise for a tutor if his young pupil no longer needed him to keep watch over his conduct because the lad had advanced so great in virtue, so too it would be the greatest praise for the law that we no longer had need of its help. For the law has brought that very thing to pass for us. It has prepared our souls to receive a greater philosophy. So it is that he who still sits at the feet of the law and can see nothing greater than what is written therein derives no great profit from it. But I put the law aside and ran to the loftier teachings of Christ. Yet I could grant to the law the greatest dignity, because it made me such that I could go beyond the trivialities written therein and rise to the loftiness of the teaching which comes to us from Christ. The law did profit our nature greatly, but only if it led us sincerely to Christ. If this be not the case, it did us harm by depriving us of the greater things because of our close attention to those which are less. It also hurt us by still keeping us in the countless wounds of our transgressions. Suppose there were two physicians, one weaker, the other stronger. If the weaker one applied medicines to the ulcers but could not free the sick man once and for all from the pain coming from his sores, then... Now this is a narrator's note. This remaining portion of this manuscript was lost until it was found by a lady in a monastery. And I continue now with the remaining portion of homily two. And I will jump back after that without any note into the original homily two. The law did help our nature very much, but only if it genuinely leads us to Christ. By the same token, if it does not do this, it has actually hurt us by depriving us of greater things through attention to smaller things, and by continuing to keep us confined in the countless wounds of our transgressions. Indeed, suppose there were two doctors, one less powerful, the other more powerful, and the one, although he applied medicines to the patient's sores, was not able to free the afflicted person once and for all from the pain they caused, but only brought some slight relief, whereas the other doctor, the more powerful one, arrived, taking all those medicines away and simply washing the sick person, he was able to purify him of his afflictions, leaving no further trace, not even the slightest mark. And then suppose that the first doctor tried to prevent the patient from being treated by that better doctor. What help could he possibly provide by the application of his medicines that would be as great as the damage he caused by preventing the patient from taking the brief way, the quickest way, to health? This is also how you should think when it comes to Christ and the law. The law applies medicines, bringing altogether slight relief for our sores. Christ 
on the other hand, when he came, took away all these things by washing us with the water of baptism. He allowed no trace or mark of our previous wounds to remain. So then, one who still clings to the law is doing nothing but disbelieving in the skill of the doctor and denying that baptism is sufficient to take away his trespasses. For running to the law is the mark of one who is afraid that Christ is not strong enough to free us from our prior sins through his own grace, and this is proof of the worst unbelief. Such people are committing outrage on both the law and on Christ, disbelieving both the one and the other. By clinging to the law, they are disbelieving in Christ's grace, but by clinging to it only in part, they have charged it with great weakness. Tell me, is the law alone, by itself, able to justify? Yes. Well, then, why do you not fulfill it completely? But is it fairly weak and feeble? Well, then, obviously you think so, if you only keep it in part. Again, is Christ able to grant the forgiveness of all your sins? Yes. Well, then, why do you cling to the law and fear that you will be judged as a transgressor for not keeping one of the law's commandments? This is the mark of those who do not truly have confidence in Christ's kindness. At this point, it is timely to say, Woe to a fearful heart, and to slack hands, and to a sinner who walks upon two paths. For you must imagine that what has been said about circumcision has also been said about fasting, and about every other commandment of the law. If you keep it now, at the wrong time, just as if someone is now circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to him. Indeed, so that you will not think this statement only pertained to circumcision, but instead understand that it applied to the entire law, if someone were to keep it now, at the wrong time, you must listen to what he says. You who are trying to be justified by the law have fallen away from grace. What further punishment could be equal to this one? But may this not happen to our brothers. I do call them brothers, even if they are sick in countless ways, because of my hopes. For their health. Now then, let me strip down for the fight against the Jews themselves, so that the victory may be more glorious, so that you will learn that they are abominable and lawless and murderous and enemies of God. For there is no evidence of wickedness I can proclaim that is equal to this. But in order to amass forensic-style speeches against them, I shall first demonstrate that even if they had not been deprived of their ancestral way of life, even so their fast would be polluted and impure. And I shall provide the proofs from the law itself and from Moses. For if it was lawless when it was observed, while the law was in effect and in power, so much the more now that the law has ceased— and I shall demonstrate that not only the fast, but also the other practices which they observe, sacrifices and purifications and festivals, are all abominable. And when the very manner of purification is illegal as practiced, and would be rejected as loathsome, which of their other rituals can purify them thereafter? The best starting point for the demonstration will be their observance with regard to the place. For God led them out of the whole world and confined them in a single place, Jerusalem. And in no other place were they permitted to fast, to sacrifice, to celebrate festivals or tabernacles, or indeed to read the law at the time when the law was in force. And if back then, whenever these rites were conducted outside Jerusalem, the procedure constituted transgression, all the more so now. If you wish, I will read the laws that were set down for them concerning these matters. First, let me recite the law set down concerning the festival of Passover. For you shall not be able to celebrate the Passover in any of the cities which the Lord your God gives you, but at the place which the Lord your God chooses for his name to be called. There, meaning Jerusalem, for his name had been called over that city, as Daniel also made plain, when he prayed and said, Look at the destruction of us and of your city, upon which your name has been called over it. He used this term for the city, not because God has a city, of course not, but in order to make the place more awesome by virtue of the fear inherent in the appellation. So then, 
This law is one that prohibits them from carrying out the sacrifices of the Passover anywhere outside Jerusalem, not only in Syria and Cilicia and among other peoples, but even in Palestine itself. For you shall not be able to celebrate the Passover in any of the cities which the Lord your God gives you. And the cities he gave were in Judea. Do you see how they have been forced out, not out of the world, but out of the rest of the province itself, into one single place? Again, concerning the festival, which is now imminent, he warns, For seven days you shall celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, when you gather in from your threshing floor and your wine vat. For because they were ungrateful and unmindful of their benefactor, he bound their remembrance of the kindness of God into the necessities of their festivals. And at the same time, they would learn the reason for the festival. For when the harvest is complete, he says, celebrate days of thanksgiving to the giver of the requested sustenance. For seven days you shall celebrate the festival, you and your son and your daughter and your male servant and your female servant, the proselyte, the foreigner who is attached to you, the orphan and the widow. For seven days you shall keep the festival unto the Lord God in the place which the Lord your God chooses. And as for the fact that they were not even allowed to read the law outside Jerusalem, listen to this. After seven years, at the time of the year of release, the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes together to appear before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses, there you shall read the law. There you shall fast for the Feast of the Tabernacles. Do you see that he preserves this stipulation also in the case of the fast? Next, in order not to go through each thing individually, he added in summary fashion that it was in no way permitted for them to carry out their customary rituals of worship anywhere else, saying, Be careful not to offer your burnt offerings in any place you see, but in the place which the Lord your God chooses for his name to be called. There you shall offer your sacrifices. There you shall perform all that I command you today. For when he said all, he included by using this word, festivals, and sacrifices, and lustrations, and purifications, and whatever else was in the law. Then, because they were thoughtless and senseless, and his exhortation was not sufficient to persuade them, he also added the inexorable punishment for those who disobeyed. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and the children of Israel, saying, any one from among you, or from among the proselytes and foreigners who are attached to you, whoever slaughters a bull calf, or a sheep, or a goat, outside the camp, or in the camp itself, and does not bring his sacrifice to the doors of the tent of witness, blood shall be reckoned for him. That man has shed blood. Now what does it mean that blood shall be reckoned for him? Meaning he will be condemned for murder having become just like a murderer. For God was not paying attention to the nature of what was sacrificed, but to the mindset of the one who was sacrificing. For this reason it was reckoned as murder, because the slaughter took place contrary to God's wishes. Do you see how closely guarded the issue of place was? The one who does not sacrifice at the doors of the tent of witness, he says, will be punished just as if he has killed a human being, even if he is sacrificing a sheep. And further tightening the punishment, he says, that soul shall be cut off from his people. Why? Because he did not bring his sacrifices to the door of the tent of witness. And why does he order them to sacrifice there? So that they will not sacrifice to their idols and, quote, to the vain things which they themselves engage in prostitution. Do you see that the very reason is an indictment of their impiety and prostitution? For he always calls their impiety prostitution. He drove them together from all quarters into a single place for this reason, so that they would have no occasion for impiety, 
When a well-born and free man has a female slave who is licentious and puts in all the passers-by for immoral relations with her, he does not allow her to go out into the neighborhood, to show herself in the alleyway, to rush into the marketplace. Instead, he confines her upstairs in the house, shackles her with iron, and orders her to remain indoors at all times so that both the spatial re restrictions of the place and the compulsion of the chains will be her starting point for chastity. God acted in the very same way. The synagogue, being his licentious slave woman, gaping after every demon and every idol, and rushing to make sacrifices to the idols in every spot and every place, he confined it in Jerusalem and the temple as though in the master's house, and ordered it to sacrifice and celebrate festivals at appointed times there only, so that both the spatial restrictions of the place and the observance of the times would keep it, even unwillingly, in the law of piety. Sit there and be modest, he says to the prostitute. Let the place train you, since your character did not. And to confirm that this is the reason why he commanded sacrifice there only, you have heard the law that has now been read among us. It runs as follows. For they shall bring their sacrifices to the door of the tent of witness. And it goes on to add the reason. So that they will not sacrifice to their idols and to the vain things with which they themselves engage in prostitution. For there was no spot in all Palestine that was not defiled by their impiety. Instead, every hill Every ravine and every tree was privy to this impiety of theirs. For this reason, Hosea cried aloud and said, They sacrificed upon the hills, they made sacrifices upon the summits of the mountains, under oak and pine and shade-giving tree, because the shelter was good. And Jeremiah said, Lift your eyes around you and see, where did they not engage in prostitution? It was for this reason that God, seeing that they had gone astray, confined them in one spot, the temple. But not even this put a stop to their licentiousness, rather as if obstinately wishing to demonstrate to their Lord that whatever he did they would not abandon their madness, they brought adulterous lovers into the Lord's house, at one time setting up a four-faced idol there, at another time painting the abominations of reptiles and cattle on the walls. Ezekiel made this known to us, for he was brought from Babylon to the temple, and when he saw them burning incense to the sun and mourning for Adonis and worshipping all the other idols in the temple itself, he cried out in distress. But the prophet did not point out only this rampant impiety, but also approached the subject in another way, speaking as follows, There came to be in you a perversion beyond all women. How is it that payments are made to all prostitutes, he says, but you gave out payments? For they engaged in prostitution and paid money for their own prostitution, which is the greatest proof of a soul that is being driven mad by the sting of its own profligacy. So then, because the house did not make them modest, instead they set up their idols there, in the end God raised the temple itself to the ground. For what need was there? for that place, given that idols were standing there and demons were being served in it. Now, I want to reckon up just what I promised you at first. What was it, then, that I promised? To show that they are transgressing in all they now do, and in the first place, in the festival of Passover. The fact that they are not simply transgressing the law, but are manifestly also murderers when they celebrate this festival outside Jerusalem, is clear from what I have said. This has been proved most abundantly by the grace of God. Therefore, whenever they sacrifice the Passover lamb, either here or elsewhere, they are manifestly murderers. For if, when someone does not bring his sacrifice to the door of the tent of witness, the sacrifice is reckoned as blood and murder, and if these people make their sacrifices not only outside the temple, but even outside the city, indeed everywhere on earth, then it is quite obvious that they are enmeshed in the pollution of murder, to an enormous degree. In the same way, when they celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles and their other festivals, they are again impure and defiled. For if everything is purified by means of the sacrifices, and apart from the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness, 
then once all the sacrifices have been taken away with the destruction of the temple, it necessarily follows that the methods of purification and the customs of all the festivals have been taken away, or that if they are practiced, they cause even greater pollution because they are performed in an unlawful manner. Not only were they not permitted to sacrifice outside the temple, they were not even permitted to sing elsewhere, as the prophet also made plain. For when they had been carried off to Babylon, and those who had taken them captive wanted to hear Jewish songs, and would say to them, Sing to us some of the songs of Zion. They would answer, by way of informing them, that it was not permissible to sing outside Jerusalem. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? But neither did they fast in a foreign land. Listen to what God said to them through Zechariah. For seventy years you have not fasted a fast for me, have you? Referring indirectly to the time of the captivity. It has also been proved that they were permitted to make sacrifices there only. For this reason, the three children said, There is no ruler or prophet at this time, nor any place to make an offering and find mercy. Now, of course, there was a place in Babylonia, but not the customary place. For they hearkened to Moses, who said, be careful not to offer your burnt offerings in any place you see, but in the place which the Lord your God chooses. Thus, when they were allowed neither to sacrifice, nor to sing, nor to be purified, nor to read the law, for indeed another prophet likewise made the same charge when he said, and brought it out as a great accusation, they read the law outside and invoked confession. When, therefore, they were allowed to do none of these things, what defense will they possibly have hereafter? They condemn and defile themselves by their myriad paths of transgression. And that is why I called their fast impure, right from the beginning, because it is carried out unlawfully. Indeed, their Passover and Feast of Tabernacles and whatever else they do are profane and abominable. And what they carry out is not worship, but lawlessness and transgression and outrage committed on God. You see, if they did not dare to do any of these things during their sojourning in a foreign land, as my discourse has proved, when they expected to recover their ancestral city and return to the temple, then they are obligated much more now to stay idle, to refrain from action, and to not carry out any of these things, now that there is no longer any hope that they will recover Jerusalem. For that city shall not rise up again in the future, nor will they return to their prior form of worship. It was to make this clear to them that God opened up the whole world to them and made that spot alone inaccessible, and thus there are imperial laws keeping them away and not allowing them to set foot in the doorway of the city. That city is and will remain off limits for the Jews at all times. But on the very day of their fast, I will demonstrate that Jerusalem will not rise again if you are present again with the same enthusiasm and I see this hall made just as magnificent as it is now with the multitude of the listeners. Today, on the other hand, it is necessary to tell you why God opened the entire world to the Jews, but made that city alone inaccessible. Why, then, did he do this? He knew their obstinacy and shamelessness their willfulness and disobedience. He knew that they would not easily choose to give up their former way of life conducted with sacrifices and burnt offerings and go toward the higher, more spiritual life of the Gospels. What then did he do? After tying their worship of him to the necessity of sacrifices, he furthermore confined the sacrifices themselves to the temple. And after doing this, he made the place off limits for them so that from the fact that they were not allowed to set foot in Jerusalem, they would become aware that it was now not permissible for them to sacrifice. And from the absence of sacrifice, they would be taught not to cling to the rest of their forms of worship any longer, and would be able to see that it was no longer the proper time for that way of life, that instead God was calling them to a greater and a different philosophy. A loving mother who has a nursing child, but later is eager to wean him away from milk nourishment and lead him towards other kinds of nourishment, when she sees that he is unwilling and resistant and continues to seek her breast and insinuate himself into her maternal bosom, she smears gall or some other kind of very bitter juice around the very nipple of her breasts 
and thus compels him, unwilling as he is, to turn away from the source of milk in future. In the very same way, God, wanting to lead them to more solid nourishment, but then seeing them constantly running back to Jerusalem and its way of life, walled off the city like a mother's nipple with bile and the bitterest juice, the fear of the Romans, and by means of imperial decrees, he made it become off-limits for them. His intention was that because of the desolation and the soldiers' weapons, they would stand aloof from their homeland and little by little become accustomed to rejecting their desire for milk and slipping into a love and a craving for solid nourishment. For even though emperors caused the desolation, they were moved by God to do so. And this is clear from a comparison with the previous periods, when not even the ruler of the whole world was strong enough to take Jerusalem, since God was favorable to them. The temple was destroyed for this reason, so that they would no longer look for God in a place, but look up toward the heavens. Sacrifices were taken away for this reason, so that they would be able to see the true sacrifice as well, which took away the sin of the world. But if they are not willing to change, then God for his part has displayed to them his kindness, while they, having made themselves unworthy of his goodness, will bring inexorable punishment upon themselves. But now, it is time to leave behind my discourse with them and to direct my criticism against those who have gone off to hear the trumpets. Indeed, I ought not to have considered them even worth taking into account at this point, since after so much exhortation and advice, they still persisted in the same stupidity. But I do expect to correct their ways by the second exhortation, and to persuade them to condemn their own stupidity with regard to their earlier behavior. Thus, I eagerly embark on these remarks directed at them. For indeed, I know that by the grace of God, many of those who were accustomed to do these things have departed from their wicked custom. And if not all were persuaded, yet they shall be persuaded by all means. A body that is beginning to be healthy makes progress on a path so as to cast off all its illness and finally return to a state of pure health. So you ran to hear the trumpets. Tell me. Now I wish to have a conversation with them in their absence, as though they were present. For even so does the soul that is in pain converse with people as though they are present and listening, even if those it is attacking are not listening. So then, you ran to hear the trumpets. Tell me. With those murderers, with those charlatans, with those delirious and raving mad Jews, did you not listen to Christ, who said, the one who looks at a woman to desire her has already committed adultery with her in his heart? For just as a licentious gaze produces adultery, so also untimely hearing works impiety. But you desire to hear a trumpet. Then listen to the trumpet of Paul, the spiritual trumpet blaring out from the heavens and saying, Take up the full armor of God, gird your loins with truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, cover your feet with the equipment of the gospel of peace, take up the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. Do you see how a spiritual trumpet arms you and leads you out to the battle against the demons? Listen to the thunder of John, saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Wait for the trumpet that will sound from the heavens. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead will rise again. Those who hear this earthly trumpet will not hear that heavenly one, or rather they will hear it, but to their own detriment. For participation in the Jewish festival will mean participation in their punishment. At that time, the Jews will, quote, look upon him whom they pierced. What then will happen if you appear in company with them? Is it not abundantly clear what is left as the implication? I am afraid to say it, but I impart to your consciousness. You sound the trumpet with them now, so you will mourn with them then. But may it never be that any of the children of the churches be found in the gathering place of those murderous people. Not now, not ever. And that is why I have said this now, so that these things no longer take place.
But not only to men do I address these comments, but also to the women through their husbands. For indeed, I know that most of the crowd that is drawn to go there is composed of women. Now then, the blessed Paul says, Husbands, love your wives. And again, the wife should fear her husband. But I am seeing neither wives fear nor husbands love. For if the wife feared her husband, she would not have dared to go. If the husband loved his wife, he would never have allowed and tolerated her going. For what is worse than this outrage, I ask you? A free and believing woman goes out of the house and goes off to a synagogue? Does she know any other place at all apart from the church and the time spent there? But if she were going off to a lover, would you not have stood up? Would you not have been inflamed? Would you not have posted guards on all sides? But as it is, you do not see her going off to commit adultery with a man, but going off to be with demons. And you allow this impiety? If she commits a transgression against you, you punish her. But if she commits an outrage against her Lord Jesus, you overlook it? If she wantonly abuses your marriage, you are a harsh and inexorable judge. But if she tramples on the covenants with God, you are careless and slack? How can these offenses be worthy of forgiveness? And yet, God does not act that way but rather in the opposite way. When he himself is outraged, he overlooks it. When you are treated that way, he punishes. Do you wish to learn that he honors your affairs more than his own? If you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First be reconciled with your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Christ did not say, submit your offering and then go away, but let it stay there unoffered and go first to be reconciled to your brother. Nor did he do this only here, but again in another place. If a man has an infidel wife, that is a Gentile, he is not forced to put her away. For St. Paul said, if a man has any unbelieving wife and she consents to live with him, let him not put her away. But if he has a wife who is a harlot, and an adulteress, there is nothing to stop him from putting her away. For Christ said, Everyone who puts away his wife, save on account of immorality, causes her to commit adultery. And so he is allowed to put her away because of immorality. Do you see God's loving kindness and concern? He says, If your wife be a Gentile, do not put her away. But if she be a harlot, I do not stop you from doing so. What he means is this, if she acts outrageously toward me, do not put her away. If she outrages you, there is no one to stop you from putting her away. If God then showed us such honor, will we not deem him deserving of equal honor? Will we let him be outraged by our wives? Will we permit this even though we realize that the greatest punishment and vengeance will be stored up for us when we neglect the salvation of our wives? This is why he made you to be the head of the wife. This is why Paul gave the order, if wives wish to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home. So that you, like a teacher, a guardian, a patron, might urge her to godliness. Yet when the hour set for the services summons you to the church, you fail to rouse your wife from their sluggish indifference. But now that the devil summons your wives to the Feast of the Trumpets, and they turn a ready ear to this call, you do not restrain them. You let them entangle themselves in accusations of ungodliness. You let them be dragged off into licentious ways. For as a rule, it is the harlots, the effeminates, and the whole chorus from the theater who rush to that festival. And why do I speak of the immorality that goes on there? Are you not afraid that your wife may not come back from there after a demon has possessed her soul? Do you not hear in my previous discourse the argument which clearly proved to us that demons dwell in the very souls of the Jews and in places which they gather? Tell me, then, how do you Judaizers have the boldness, after dancing with demons, to come back to the assembly of the apostles? After you have gone off and shared with those who shed the blood of Christ, how is it that you do not shudder to come back and share in his sacred banquet to partake of his precious blood? Do you not shiver? Are you not afraid when you commit such outrages? 
Have you so little respect for that very banquet? I have spoken these words to you. You will speak them to those Judaizers, and they to their wives. Fortify one another. If a catechumen is sick with this disease, let him be kept outside the church doors. If the sick one be a believer and already initiated, let him be driven from the holy table. For not all sins need exhortation and counsel. Some sins, of their very nature, demand cure by a quick and sharp excision. The wounds we can tolerate respond to more gentle cures. Those which have festered and cannot be cured, those which are feeding on the rest of the body, need cauterization with a point of steel. So is it with sins. Some need long exhortation, others need sharp rebuke. This is why Paul did not enjoin us to exhort in every case, but also to rebuke sharply. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply. Therefore, I will now rebuke them sharply, so that they may accuse themselves and feel shame for what they have done. Then they will never again be hurt by that sinful fast. So, I shall put aside exhortation henceforth, as I testify and exclaim, If any man does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let a curse be upon him. What greater evidence could there be that a man does not love our Lord than when he participates in the festival with those who slew Christ? It was not I who hurled the curse at them, but Paul. Rather, it was not Paul, but Christ, who spoke through Paul and said earlier, Those who are justified in the law have fallen away from grace. So, speak these words to them. Read aloud to them these texts. Show all your zeal in saving them. When you have snatched them from the devil's jaws, bring them to me on the day of the Jewish fast. Then, after I have kept the rest of my promise to you, let us, with one accord and with one voice, join our brothers in giving glory to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for to him is glory forever and ever. Amen.